bitter ending. A new beginning. It was nice to meet you. Same here. A first date. I knew this wasn't such a good idea. That could be her last. I don't think we go to it. I think it comes to us. A special Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm just a sweet transvestite. Vampire Slayer, Season 2, Episode 5, Reptile Boy, written by David Greenwald and Joss Whedon, and directed by the former, is one of the more overt feminist episodes, with a message about teenage girls needing to be cautious of fraternities because they can be misogynistic rapists who run parties to claim victims. There's even reference to Delta Epsilon having a rape addict in its building. One Swarthmore senior showed us what she describes as a similar room at Phi Psi. She claims she was sexually assaulted in their building her freshman year. Unfortunately, it has a more problematic framing, putting the onus on women to avoid dangerous situations more than blaming the perpetrators. Something that will be more specifically attempted in Season 2, Episode 16, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. On the other hand, the masculine evil element is really overt, with a phallic snake demon that is the source of their power. The writers don't even try to pretend that that's not what they were going for. In several behind-the-scenes featurettes, they're like, yeah, we made a penis monster. Just don't mind the phallic imagery, I guess I would say about Reptile Boy. Um, you know, yes, it's a metaphor. I first experienced Reptile Boy through its novelization in The Angel Chronicles, Volume 1, by Nancy Holder. As a late arrival to the series, I figured that the novelizations would be a good way to get important backstory. The Angel Chronicles retells Reptile Boy as an angel-centric story, and I perceived it as a fun gothic murder mystery with intrigue and romance. When I finally saw the episode, I was immensely disappointed. So many of David Greenwald's directorial choices are less than ideal. The demon looks especially fake, and I swear the cameraman forgot to set the white balance for several scenes. Add that to the less than perfectly feminist writing, and the episode just ends up as a mess. It is easily one of my top 10 least favorite episodes of the show. Reptile Boy was a great episode. Ah yes, words of wisdom from the woman who thought that deadly sibling rivalry was a good movie. The episode starts with Buffy, Willow, and Xander hanging out, trying to understand a Bollywood movie, something that they never actually seem to be into in any other episode. Given the snake monster later in the episode, the presence of an Indian film is probably supposed to be thematic of the half-man, half-snake figure from Indian mythology, commonly referred to by the Sanskrit word for snake, Naga. How the film is used in the scene is pretty racist, with these three white kids knocking at how weird Indian movies are. We haven't strayed far from Season 2, Episode 4, Inca Mummy Girl. Reptile Boy increases the growing sexual tension between Buffy and Angel. Season 2, Episode 1, When She Was Bad, had Buffy laughing off Xander and Willow's suggestion that they would be up to second base when they're barely together, but now it establishes that Buffy has second base dreams about Angel. She's just nervous about asking him out. Willow suggests asking him to go for coffee, but he rejects the idea because he thinks it's a sign that Buffy doesn't know what she wants out of a romance. This leads to a memorable Buffy and Angel gothic vampire romance exchange. When I kiss you, you don't wake up from a deep sleep and live happily ever after. No. When you kiss me, I want to die. It sounds like an epic romance line. Death is thematic of vampire slaying, representing both the vampires and the state that Buffy constantly flirts with when she puts her life on the line, as is described in Season 5, Episode 7, Fool for Love, as something that every slayer is curious about, being on the other side of the penetration and allowing the vampire to have one good day. Hey! As in Fool for Love, there is an association between death and sex, derivative of Elizabethan slang that remains present in modern pop culture due to its presence in the works of William Shakespeare, of which Joss Whedon is a fan. The French La Petite Mort, meaning the small death, 
Yes, I looked up how to pronounce it this time. Remains a classy euphemism for orgasm. Buffy going to die by Angel's kiss evokes both vampiric destruction and consummating their sexual desire. I can lay my body down, but I can't find my sweet release. Cordelia, meanwhile, has Buffy envious because Cordelia is supposedly more successful than Buffy for dating college guys, specifically the frat guys of Delta Zeta Kappa. I have to wonder if David Greenwald and Joss originally went for Delta Iota Kappa, and then someone at the WB was like, hey, wait a minute. Does it sound unbelievable? Well, check out my review of the first season of Scream Queens for an actual example of this kind of thing. Cordelia's technique is about degrading herself for the sake of a guy, acting stupid, centering the guy's desires, and exaggerating his charisma. It's a basic misogynistic setup to be dismissed by the end of the episode, but Buffy initially accepts it when she seemingly blows her chances with Angel. The frat boys need more than one sacrifice, so they pressure Cordelia to bring Buffy along to their frat party, and she agrees. I'm not going with Angel, I'm going with Egods. Cordelia? Cordelia is much better for you than Angel. It's heterosexism that a potential Buffy Cordelia dating scenario isn't acknowledged. People can be queer, but there's never even a question if it's something other than platonic. Both Buffy and Willow will be depicted as queer in the future, and it represents a homophobic understanding of the world that everyone is just assumed to be straight. At this point, we've seen the frat boys hunt down a girl, so we know danger is there and are worried for Buffy and Cordelia. Angel tells Buffy that a dropped bracelet has blood on it, and Giles tells Buffy to patrol. Similar to Season 1, Episode 5, Never Kill a Boy on the First Date, Buffy conflicts with Giles about her slaying duties versus her dating life. So she lies and says that she needs to stay home with her sick mother and goes to the frat party instead. After Willow speculates that the frat boys would have an orgy, Xander decides to crash the party, halfway to look after Buffy, halfway in hopes of group sex. Considering that Buffy and Cordelia aren't supposed to be there themselves and are after sex to some degree, I don't think that Xander's efforts to achieve such are to be disrespected, but do think that his nominal altruistic reason for being there is condescendingly paternalistic. He's successful at picking up women before the frat identifies him as a party crasher and forces him to take part in a hazing ritual. They sloppily dress him as a woman and make him dance while they paddle him. So it's just like an anime convention. This part fits into that intersection of misogyny, transphobia, and homophobia. It presents the state of being a woman as being degrading, making Xander humiliated by assuming feminine traits. Androgyny is portrayed as undesirable and grotesque with exaggerated ugliness. It is transphobic and homophobic in the way that there is overlap in the general queer sphere. Joss Whedon has an enduring interest in androgyny and transgender subjects, but they are rarely portrayed positively, just as subjects of intrigue and feminist explorations of gender roles in the second wave science fiction genre. In his Tumblr, Ask Me Anything, he describes the first character he ever made as an androgynous demigod named Mouseflesh. And his body of published work contains several examples of overt androgyny and transgender body swaps or transformations. Occasionally, it'll get a positive portrayal of expanding horizons and notions of gender, but they're more often than not used for arousing disgust, if not outright horror. Guy asked me to help find his mommy and... Did I want to play Pretty Princess with him? That he's not going to like kindergarten because there's boys. Maybe this sick sap saw what was coming and just decided I can be whoever I want. His treatment of actual transgender people has been less than stellar. In 2014, he gave advice on how to write a strong female character in which he gave the requirement of no peeny slash balls. Following backlash, including from feminist comics writer Gail Simone, he backtracked and used the just joking defense to deflect criticism. From his recent Twitter activity, I think that he has since recognized that as a flaw of his and is currently trying to rectify it, which I hope will translate into transpositive depictions in the upcoming spinoff. 
Monica Uwusu Breen has made some intriguing likes and retweets, including a writer's workshop on transgender narratives and an analysis of transphobic hate groups. However, all of the original Buffy and Angel episodes fall into Joss's more transphobic period. This is the first depiction of the transgender subject matter in Buffy canon, as opposed to Night of the Living rerun, and it is particularly unflattering. Tom flirts with Buffy, and he seems like a nice guy, while Richard comes on too strong and seems like bad news. I don't think it's a coincidence that Richard's name is almost Dick. Tom flatters Buffy by calling her more mature than he is, and he encourages her to try an adult beverage. I like you beer. For that. I like beer. I don't know if you do. Okay. Do you like beer, Senator, or not? Um, what do you like to drink? Next one is... Senator, what do you like judge. to drink? Buffy drinks. As it turns out, the drink was spiked. Richard is put forward as the culprit, and he tries to rape her, but Tom stops him. Because she belongs to the penis monster. They're God. Turns out, he can't trust the nice guys either. She and Cordelia wake up in the basement with bracelet owner Callie chained up in a classic pulp adventure style. This is a bit of a sexual image, which is not the best way to frame our hero's sexuality. She should be sexy in an empowered way, not in her own victimization. At the library, Willow and Giles investigate the bracelet and identify it as coming from Kent Preparatory School, and they learn of Callie. Discussion with Angel about where he found the bracelet links it with a nearby fraternity at Crestwood College. Willow figures out that Buffy may be in danger and, angry that it's come to this, admits what Buffy did while lashing out at Giles and Angel for not treating her well. They don't get angry back because it's sweet to mirror Willow. When even she gets upset, it must be important. The fact that she even can get that upset shows how much she's grown since the series began. They go to rescue Buffy and run into Xander, who was kicked out and stole what turned out to be cult robes, to sneak back in. Willow asks why he's wearing lipstick, which is supposed to be a comedic reminder of Xander's humiliation for schadenfreude, and carries the same sexist slash homophobic slash transphobic quality as the main scene. Structurally, it's similar to a joke in the pilot when Willow asks why Xander is holding a purse. That's right, men can never do anything feminine. Fight for that, MRAs. The cultists are in the basement, so they're going to break in. Angel feels particularly motivated to rescue Buffy, growling in a macho vampire way. With Buffy. It's obnoxious paternalism on the order of Xander ostensibly watching over Buffy, but I get the sense that the writers were trying to feel out what would be attractive to teen girls when making Angel especially passionate here. This is part of how the Angel-Buffy dynamic can be problematic. Meanwhile, the cultists summon Makita, the penis monster. You penis! The idea is, if they sacrifice girls to him, he'll give them power in society. It's an overt commentary on the patriarchal Greek system and its associated rape culture. It's used to feminist effect when Buffy fights back. Tom tells Buffy to shut up and calls her a bitch, threatening her with his phallic knife. Great knife! Although I think um, it may technically be a, a sword. Buffy then tells him that he talks too much, in a subversion of the whole concept of her and Cordelia needing to shut up to be seen as attractive to these supposedly mature males, and she shoves him across the room. Buffy doesn't kill humans, at least not yet, so she doesn't end him, but she knocks him down, and it's implied he goes to jail at the end. The Scoobies help fight off the cultists. Xander gets to cathartically beat up the guys who humiliated him, reiterating the sexism slash transphobia slash homophobia. Buffy gets to deliver the killing blow to Makita, bisecting another phallic symbol, but only because they didn't have the budget to do what was in the script. In the script, Makita recognizes that his followers aren't good enough to feed him and abandons them, grabbing Tom to eat in place of the sacrifices. So, it's a corrupt patriarchal system that turns on itself when things start to go wrong, revolving around the idea that paying homage to a huge dick revitalizes the threatened masculinity of rich misogynists facing the disrespect that comes with an increasingly feminist world. Mm, no, nope. Can't see anything relevant there. It has feminist value in that after sinning as a misogynist, Tom is punished by the narrative. 
However, it is flawed for implying that we are to feel catharsis for the symbolic rapist to be symbolically raped himself. Rape should not be framed as justified for punishing wrongdoers. This problematic theme will later be featured with literal rape in Season 2, Episode 20, Go Fish. In the version of Reptile Boy we see, Buffy kills the penis monster, and that has an overt feminist message about attacking masculine rapiness. It's a simplistic and even reductive metaphor, but it's decent enough. It's hardly the last time we'll see it, either. In a welcome absence of punitive rape, all of the former and current frat members rapidly lose wealth, and some kill themselves off-screen. Fingers crossed. And then there's that problematic framing holding potential victims more at fault than potential rapists. I told one lie. I had one drink. Yes, and you were very nearly devoured by a giant demon snake. The words, let that be a lesson, are a tad redundant at this juncture. It normalizes rape culture and has a sexist portrayal of gender where women are sexual gatekeepers. Season 2, Episode 14, Innocence, will have a much better framing of this issue. If it's guilt you're looking for, Buffy, I'm, I'm not your man. All you will get from me is, is my support and my respect. Oddly, many feminists misremember Innocence as having the same problem as Reptile Boy, where Giles blames Buffy, while they never mention Reptile Boy. I can only imagine that Reptile Boy is so terrible they don't even remember it exists. The episode concludes with Angel agreeing to go out for coffee with Buffy. Their relationship inches forward. If Reptile Boy was done well, it could be one of the better Season 2 episodes. It has an interesting reach and scope, incorporating a newly established college setting and the element of duration, where we see that this cult has been carrying on in Sunnydale for a long time. It could touch on the revelation that authority figures are aware of demons, and could show how our heroes relate to their world while developing their characters and relationships. However, some problematic writing choices, flawed directorial choices, and general production problems make this episode weak, forgettable, and in my opinion, one of the worst in the entire series. Good riddance, reptile boy. Hey, I'm just a sweet transvestite. like, share, subscribe, and consider donating to my Patreon. Pledges of $2 or more will earn you an explicit thank you at the end of each video. I see you a shiver with anticipation.